Good morning. Uh, my name is Jason Thomas. I'm from our Pecola campus. Um, I haven't been here in, in about a year or so to preach, so I don't know if last time I just, I made this joke before and nobody really laughed, but I don't know if I said something like really bad last time and so they had to give it some time to let that cool off and then I could come back. But uh, either way, I'm glad to be back here with you. I, I started my time with Cross Community here at our, Pecola, or our, at our Poto campus, uh, working with some different ministries there and then eventually uh, was asked to go help out in Pecola and, and we've had a great few years over there, but I, I always enjoy coming back here and, and seeing some familiar faces from time to time. So as you saw on our buffer screen there, we're in a new series called AMA, which stands for Ask Me Anything. And, and this series is, is from you guys. We, we put out some note cards here and at the Pecola campus, and we just said, if you have questions, if there are things that you want to know about, write those down, drop that in the offering box, and we want to try and answer those. And so all these messages are, are, are concerns that you guys have had. They're, they're questions you've had. And so we, we've had some different kind of questions. We had more kind of basic fundamental questions, uh, such as what is faith, that, that Jason, um, he addressed that. And, you know, that's a question that you ask kind of as you're starting out. But then we had some that get a little bit more complex, uh, such as the Trinity. Um, and that's one that we have a hard time grasping. And so I really enjoyed that message. And then last week, um, Nathan he preached over the topic of why bad things happen to good people, and, and I don't envy that message because that's one that I don't have a great answer for, so I really appreciated the sermon that he did. And if you have questions about things like that, uh, feel free to go to our YouTube channel. Those sermons are, are uploaded to our YouTube channel, and you can see those there. And so when Jason asked me to, to preach this week, he also sent me a list and, and just said, hey, pick one of these. And I, I had a hard time deciding which message I wanted to, to address. I wrestled over this list a little bit, had some conversations with some people, and ultimately I decided to address the matter of conflict. And I think this is good timing because, as you know, Thanksgiving is coming up here in a few days and families get together and conflict can happen just in that environment with having a, a lot of emotions going. And, and so I feel like this could be very timely, hopefully, um, if you need to um, resolve any conflict, this can help you this week. And so the question more specifically uh, was, how do believers handle conflict with others in church? And, and then also, how do you handle conflict with those outside of the church? And so my, my hope is that today uh, we can examine this and we can see um, biblical ways to handle conflict. Now, the reality is that, that conflict is, is hard, right? Like, it's, it's seldom light, it's seldom easy in fact, the very definition of conflict is a serious disagreement or argument. Now, that being said, you don't need the definition of conflict to know when you're in conflict, right? Like when you're, when you're in conflict, you recognize it. It's, it's unmistakable. You, you feel it, especially if it's someone that you really care about because there's some division there. You're, you're in opposition against someone that you really care for, and, and you feel that. It's a heavy feeling. Now, there are some of you who are odd, I guess would be the word, that you, you like conflict, you embrace it, sometimes you seek it out. You, you see an argument taking place on Facebook, and, and so you're like, well, I guess it's time to go to work. I'm going to go put in my opinion on this. And I know that about you because I get that way sometimes. Like you, you see something and you're like, okay, let's, let's just get in this thing and see what we can, what we can enter into the fray. What I'll say about that is this, that the church needs people, and I, I don't mean just cross-community church, I mean the church as a whole, as, as a body, as a congregation, as, as, a, as a family, the church needs those who can enter into conflict and, and resolve it in a biblical manner. If you're someone who embraces conflict, who sees it, and, and you seek it out willingly, my prayer for you is that you can begin to embrace it from a biblical standpoint rather than a selfish one. My prayer is that you can stop, stop trying to be right and start trying to show Christ to people instead. And so my, my goal this morning as we work through this message is to hopefully help you approach conflict in a biblical manner with a kingdom mindset. Now, I don't have some, some magic phrase or, or like a get-out-of-jail-free card. Sometimes saying sorry goes a long way, uh, it doesn't hurt, but what I do have is guidance from Scripture to help you navigate the tumultuous waters of conflict. So before we address how to resolve conflict, I think it's helpful uh, to look at things that 
you should not do in conflict, things you should avoid doing in conflict. The first one, don't gossip about the person you're in conflict with. Now, there, there's a difference between seeking out counsel and seeking out wisdom and gossiping for the sake of smearing someone's name or to discredit them. All that gossip does is it creates division and burns bridges that have potential for mending. There's a song that I used to listen to, and, and the lyrics are, there's a danger in starting a fire. You never know how many bridges you'll burn. Gossip can lead to unfathomable destruction. James calls the tongue a fire lit by hell that sets our lives ablaze. He calls it a stain marring the entire person, a world of unrighteousness, a restless evil full of deadly poison, an untamable creature, and a mercenary that sometimes works for Christ and sometimes for Satan. The reality is that there's no place for gossip in the church. You know, sometimes we do it to smear someone's name. Sometimes we do it just because it's fun, right? Like we, we like talking about drama and dramatic things and things going on in the church, but there's no place for it within the church. The second thing, so the first thing was don't gossip about the person that you're in conflict with. The second thing is don't just immediately run to the pastor or, or to the elders. There's a proper order on how to resolve conflict which, which we're going to get into, but the first step is don't go and tattletale. Don't go and tattletale. There could be times where, where you need to seek wisdom of, of Jason or, or one of the elders, but many personal conflicts, many of our uh, discussions we have, many of our arguments we get into, they can be addressed one-on-one. -on -one. Now, I'm, I'm not talking about matters where your safety could be at risk. If there is a real personal safety concern, uh, if, you, if you worry about, about violence or that this person may just completely write you off or, or do something against you that's just unsafe, then yes, seek out someone else to help out in that situation. Never put yourself in harm's way. But if you're just talking about matters of disagreement, if you're just trying to seek out a trump card that you can bring to them and say, yeah, well, this is what Pastor Jason said, then I would ask you to instead seek out biblical conflict resolution. So the first thing was don't gossip about the person. The second, don't immediately run to the pastor. The third thing is don't assume you're in the right. Don't feel like you immediately have all the right answers. You know everything correctly. No one likes to be told they're wrong. Like, I get that. We don't really like to be told we're wrong. Some of us even would never admit to being wrong. There's, that's not a possibility. It could never happen. If you enter into conflict with a closed mind, you may never see where you are in error, and all that will do is hurt you more. Growth cannot happen if we close off our mind. And so that brings us to our first step in resolving conflict. We've talked about things that you should not do. Don't gossip. Don't run and tattletale. Uh, don't assume you're in the right. The first step to resolving conflict within the church, within uh, the church body, not just cross-community, with other brothers and sisters in Christ, is self-reflection. Matthew 7, and we're going to be in Matthew a few times uh, if you want to turn there, but Matthew 7, 3 through 5, says, Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when there is a log in your own eye? You hypocrite. First, take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Do not give dogs what is holy, and do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. And so we, we need to remember this about ourselves, that, that each one of us, every single person, we are all sinners, whose hearts have tendencies towards self-serving motivations and pride. So the first step in attempting to resolve conflict in a biblical manner is to examine within and check your reactions to conflict against the Word of God. We must approach those we are in conflict in with humility. We have to ask ourselves, is there anything in my heart? Is there any sin that I have not addressed in myself? Have I contributed to this conflict in some way? In many cases, we have. In many cases, there is some degree of contribution that we have to acknowledge. 
If we find any hints of sinfulness in the conflict or how we've handled it, we must repent of that sin and move forward with humility and grace if we hope to see reconciliation or experience peace. So the first step was self-reflection. Look within yourself. See where you are on the matter. The second step in resolving conflict in a biblical manner with those in the church is to go to your brother. Matthew 18, 15 says, If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. Sometimes addressing the elephant in the room is the last thing we want to do. We'd rather bury our head in the sand and avoid the person who has caused us pain or or just try to pretend that nothing ever happened. See, we can trick ourselves into thinking that we're acting rightly in doing so. We see it as as maintaining peace. We're we're avoiding it, and so peace is, is being allowed to triumph. But God calls us to be proactive, to get our head out of the sand and face conflict head on. If there is conflict in a relationship, go to your brother, go to your sister in Christ. Even if we feel like we've done nothing wrong or the other person is more at fault, we are called to be peacemakers. This can be intimidating. This is, this is hard. This is intimidating. It's not easy. We may feel like that person wants nothing to do with us. We might fear retaliation or we might fear accusations. But even so, God calls us to go, not wait for someone else to make the first move. Now, I don't want you to hear uh, this call as something that it's not. This call to go is not an invitation to go in guns blazing. It's not a call to arm yourself with with justifications and evidence and excuses or witty or snide remarks. If you have done your due diligence and self-reflection, then you should be prepared to humble yourself, confess your sins to your brother, and ask for forgiveness. Now, if, if the other party is the one that should be apologizing, if they're the ones that have been seen to be at fault, then we should seek to acknowledge their apology graciously and love rather than with condemnation. It is by God's grace alone that we are able to approach conflict with love and grace. Pray that that God would give you, would help you to go to your brother with an attitude of love and mercy. So within this step, I've got some tips to help out with this. So we're talking about um, going to your brother. So within that, here are some practical tips on going to your brother to resolve conflict. Number one, Define the problem and stick to the issue. Clearly define what the problem is and stay on topic. Don't allow anger or or past hurts or, or past issues to take over the conversation. Be clear. Define the problem and stick to the issue. The second tip for resolving conflict with your brother is plan a time for the discussion. Make make real concrete plans to get together with that other person. Be intentional. And and make sure that you're both well-rested and in a good place to have this conversation. How many of you have have had an argument that took place just because you were tired or you were hungry? Anybody heard of hanger before? Like you probably, if you've got kids or teenagers, you've you've heard of hanger. Um, If those things can, can cause arguments to happen, how much more can they influence where there is already conflict? So make sure you're, you're well-rested. Make sure both of you are uh, well-rested, that you're not tired, that you're not stressed, and you're not distracted, because those things can quickly derail the conversation. So the first thing, define the problem, stick to the issue. Second thing, plan a time for the discussion. And the third tip for going to your brother is to listen carefully. Once you share your feelings, listen to what the other person has to say. Be present and acknowledge how they feel. Reflect back to them what you believe they said so they know you're hearing them. Now, what I didn't say is I didn't say reflect back to them what they said. Because what you hear them say and what they're trying to actually say could be two different things. So tell them what you believe they said, and then if they uh, need to correct what you've reflected back to them, they can. Give them that opportunity. What this is going to do is it's going to help them feel cared for. It's going to help them feel like you're taking the matter seriously. The fourth tip for going to your brother is to extend forgiveness. Forgive others as Christ has forgiven you. Help them feel secure by telling them that you're not going to bring this up in the future. You're not going to use this in an argument down the road. Commit to not dwelling on the matter once it's resolved. 
Assure them you won't talk about the issue to those who aren't involved. We, we address the matter of gossip. Don't gossip afterwards either. So don't gossip before and try to smear their name. Don't gossip afterwards and continue uh, to just say negative things about them. Let them know that it won't stand between the relationship you have together. So, so far, when talking about resolving conflict with our brother, we've, we've said define the problem and stick to the issue. Make a time for the discussion. Listen carefully extend forgiveness, and then five, propose a solution. As you consider a solution to the conflict, think of Philippians 2, 4 and 5, which says, let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. So seek solutions that everyone, uh, their best interests are in mind, that everyone's best interests are in mind. Now, if you've approached the situation with grace and and with humility and with love and grace, and the conflict continues, then the next step comes into play. If you've gone to your brother and and that has failed, if you haven't gained your brother back, the next step comes into play. And the third step is to seek out mediation. Matthew 18 continues in verses 16 and 17 saying, But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Sometimes two believers need help resolving their conflict. Emotions can run high and resentment can creep in, clouding gentleness and encouraging impatience. Now, I believe that we're blessed here at Cross Community to have a church that um, has a family that is ready and willing to offer counsel and be called on to assist should the need arise. And the pastors and the, and the elders and the leaders and the staff at this church, they are here to help in many ways in resolving conflict in order to restore peace in the church is one of those ways. Beyond just pastors and elders, you have small group leaders, you have staff members, you have deacons that are all available to help you in the midst of your conflict. As members of the church, of of the body of Christ, we are called to pursue peace among believers and we honor God with every effort we make in that pursuit. The leaders in this church will do whatever they can to help you in times of conflict. So, so what if all this fails? What if you go to your brother and you fail, uh, or you, not you fail, but there is a failure in resolving that conflict, and, and you go to the pastor, you go to the elders, and you come together and try to resolve this conflict, and that continues to fail. You go before the church, and there's a failure there as well. What happens then? Matthew eighteen seventeen says, if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church, And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. If you have followed the outlines of Scripture in an attempt to bring reconciliation and the other person still refuses to repent, then he or she is to be thought of as an unbeliever. If we have done our best to resolve the conflict, we can rest in the knowledge that we have honored God's word. Now, this doesn't mean that you get to put in some half-hearted attempt at solving the issue and then, and then just cleaning your hands of the matter. You must give yourself fully to the work of the Lord. So we've talked about handling conflict within our church, within not just Cross Community Church, but the body of Christ as a whole. What about matters of conflict within the home or within our family? Sometimes these are other believers. Sometimes they're people who aren't believers. What about in the home? Family relationships can make managing conflict even more difficult. When managing conflict within the family, it can be helpful to have some guidelines here. So I'm going to give you a a list of some things that can help resolving family conflict. Number one, draw boundaries and plan during times of peace. Wartime is, is the wrong time to develop diplomatic tactics. When, when conflict happens and shots are being fired and words are being exchanged, that is the wrong time to plan how to deal with conflict. Plan ahead and determine how you will handle those conflicts. Ask questions. Ask questions like, what can we do to de-escalate a heated situation? If things are getting out of hand and, and the conflict isn't being resolved and, and we just continue to say hurtful things, how can we bring that back to a level space? 
Ask questions like, how has my communication been in the past? And how has that made things better or, or worse for you? Ask questions like, do you prefer to handle conflict as it happens? Or do you prefer to wait? Some people like to let heads cool off before they address the matter. Set limits to what can be said and how far you want to take the conversation. Love the other person through the conflict. We are often hurt more by our family than, than anyone else. I believe the reason for that is, is because we care more about what they have to say about us. We care more about their feelings toward us. These boundaries, what they will do is help make sure that your relationship is still intact once the conflict has been resolved. So the first tip in dealing with family conflict is to draw boundaries and plan during times of peace. The second thing is to affirm the relationship when dealing with family conflict. Help the other person feel secure and loved despite the wedge that has been temporarily driven between you. Ask for, for words of affirmation because a soft answer turns away wrath. Take that time to recognize your affection for each other, and that can help frustration levels drop. Say things like, you know, I love you, I, I care about you, but when you, when you say this, it makes me feel this way. Remind them that the love is still present in the conflict. The third tip for dealing with family conflict is to remember the cross. When we remember the cross and we remember that we have been forgiven of much, we can then love and forgive much. When we remember the grace that we've been shown, we can happily extend that grace to our family and to our loved ones. The grace we give, it does not flow from some moral high ground that we've established. The grace that we give flows from the Savior who showers His grace upon us first. So the first thing with family conflict is, um, is to draw boundaries and plan during times of peace. The second thing is to affirm the relationship. The third, remember the cross. And the fourth tip for dealing with family conflict is to recognize that we all have limits, that we all must trust God with our relationships. And sometimes, sometimes the, the conflict is too great. Sometimes the issue is, is too divisive. Sometimes hearts are too hard. It takes two willing hearts for a resolution to be met. If one person continues to hold on to their resentment, then the relationship will suffer. I would encourage you as believers, don't give up. Continue to pray and be willing to offer love and grace should the other person open their hearts to restoring the relationship. So we've talked about conflict within the church. We've talked about conflict within our family. What about conflicts that we aren't involved in? We see uh, people within the church that are having an argument, and, and they're not really able to resolve that on their own, but they're not seeking out help as well. When, if ever, should we intervene when we see division between two people within the church? Galatians 6.1 says, Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, like unforgiveness or conflict, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. James 5, 19 through 20 says, Brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. As believers, our, our goal isn't only to walk in the light but to help others walk in the light as well. When intervening in conflict among other believers, there are a few things that we have to do. First, we have to pray for wisdom. Seek out Scripture on the matter and help find biblical footing. We're going to talk about gossip again. Don't gossip about the people involved and talk about them before you can ever actually speak to them. Make sure you have a level of trust with them before you approach the issue. Ask questions. Make sure that you understand what's going on before you give any kind of input. You could be completely in the wrong in what your understanding of their conflict is about. So ask questions and understand. And pray for resolution and for the gospel to shine above all. So what about, what about when we have conflict with those outside of the church? You know, people outside of the church, they don't fight by our rules. You know, they don't, they don't care about going to your brother and then going to the pastor and going to the church. They don't fight by those rules. How do we resolve conflict with them? 
The steps I've given so far, they can help. Uh, Self-reflection, seeing where we are in the matter, setting those boundaries, those things can help. But how do we how do we approach that conflict? As Christians, we always want to be people who live according to Scripture and point others to Jesus in all we do. So I want to give two simple approaches that, that I believe will help you resolve conflict with non-believers. The first thing is to stop and think. This step looks very similar to step one in handling conflict with your brother. Take time for self-reflection and see where your heart is on the matter. Ask yourself, what's, what's the best approach for this conflict? How should I approach this situation? What do you want to accomplish? How should you respond? Now, don't just jump into any conflict without any kind of plan. What, you, what can happen is you can quickly back the other party or yourself into a corner, and more often than not, cornered people move into self-preservation mode. And when that happens, we can fail to react rationally and can lose a sense of what's best in the matter. So the first thing is to stop and think. The second thing uh, when dealing with those outside of the church with conflict is to lose the need to win. Now this is tough because we've already talked about how we don't like to be told we're right. But if you come into a volatile situation with a must-win attitude, you cloud your ability to work towards the best result. Being self-centered always gets in the way of healthy conflict. Humble yourself and commit to doing what is best, even if that means you don't get your way. Now, I'm I'm not saying to, to lose yourself in the conflict. I'm not saying to give in to the other party completely, but rather try to reach a solution that works for everyone. Never compromise your beliefs, especially where the gospel is concerned. Never compromise your beliefs, but with humility, express where you stand. The goal of resolving conflict peacefully with those outside of the church is for the door to remain open for you to be able to witness to them. By showing humility and extending grace, you can show them the love of Jesus. I would encourage you, don't just avoid conflict with non-believers. Avoiding conflict cuts off from one of the best opportunities for grace. We must believe that God will work in the tension, will work in the pain, and in the mess. Now, I want to address an area of conflict that is probably the easiest for us to find ourselves in. That's online conflict. It happens so fast, it happens so quickly. As referenced earlier, James 3, 5 through 6, describes the tongue as a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire, and the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. The power of the tongue, whether it's spoken or if it's typed out, is disproportionate to its size. Such a small thing can cause massive destruction. James continues saying, Every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. Poisonous, deadly, a cursor. The, the tongue, the thumbs, the Facebook status, the, the tweet, the comment thread, the destruction knows no bounds. As those who have been forgiven, we are to be marked by gracious speech. As those who have been forgiven, we are to be marked by gracious speech. Paul in Colossians 4, 5 through 6 says to walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. Our speech is to be gentle. It's to be mindful of Christ. As new creations in Christ, we put on a compassionate heart. We put on kindness, we put on humility, meekness, and patience, forgiveness, and love. 
as, as the fires of online conflict blaze, the believer has the opportunity to bear grace upon the situation. Now, speak hard truths, confront error, contend for truth, debate, rebuke, say unpopular things, but don't be known as quarrelsome. Don't be known as harsh. Don't be known as severe. Be known for having patience. Be known for being compassionate and and giving the benefit of the doubt. Our most compelling emblem for not shying away from conflict, but instead facing it head on, is the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus spent his life seeing needs and facing them head on. The direction of his life inevitably led him towards conflict, not away from it. As we look to live like Christ, we are to move toward conflict, toward need, toward pain, toward tension, and to the grace that can flourish on the other side. See, for for Jesus, the, the trajectory of his life led him to Calvary, where he rescued us from our greatest conflict with sin and eternal separation from God. As we approach conflict, we would do well to remember the fruits of the Spirit, applying them in the midst of our conversation, the fruits of love, the fruits of peace, kindness, and and gentleness. As Paul says in Timothy 2, we must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, and correcting with gentleness. See, in ourselves and in our sinful nature, we are unable to address conflict with intentionality and kindness. Pray for the strength of the Lord and his understanding to carry you through. Move forward in faith knowing that if tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword cannot separate us from the love of Christ, then neither can conflict. No matter how intense, no matter how complicated or intimidating or emotional or personal, for us as believers, we rejoice in Christ. We rejoice in the love and the grace of Jesus. Conflict is an opportunity for grace to triumph and the Word of God to be elevated. This morning, we're going to have an opportunity to respond uh, to this message. And what I would encourage you to do is, is to spend that time in prayer. If, if there is conflict in your life, if there are unresolved issues, don't stick your head in the sand. Don't keep your head buried. Face the conflict head on and watch Christ work in the midst of the pain. Watch Christ work in the midst of the difficulties and see grace on the other side. Extend forgiveness. If you guys would, uh, bow your heads with me and, and we're going to have a time of response. Father, we thank you. We we thank you for the conflict that you didn't shy away from, that you saw our need, you saw where we fell short, you saw where we were broken and in need of a Savior, and you faced that head on. You didn't shy away from it, and you have forgiven us of so much. Father, help us to see the grace that we've been shown and to extend that grace to others whether it's within the church or it's in our family or those outside of the church or online, help us to be gracious. Help us to show the love of Christ in all that we do. Help us to rest in you and to remember that that in the end, you win. That any conflict doesn't matter in the scheme of eternity because you have victory over death, and we share in that victory with you. So help us to remember that in all we do and and to be grateful in all circumstances, in all moments, in all phases of life. God, we we thank you, we love you, and, and God, we just pray that you would continue to help us honor you in all that we do. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.